The two different things which appear in my data are closely related to each other. One of them will be trace dividend distributions, and I realize that not, not many people in this audience <coughs> know what it is. I will try to define what it is. And uh, the second object will be attempt to solve special class of supersymmetric gauge series. And by this, I mean for dimensional superconformal gauge series. And we already had a few talks at the beginning of this week, one by Poitier. Uh, which was also discussing uh, similar things in the specific gauge series. And this uh, talk is based on some work which I have done together with Andrei Belitsky, Matteo Bicaria, and Arkady Zeitman. Oh? Yeah. 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 yeah, to the ceiling. To, to the hammer. Ah, sorry. Very nice. Too fast. No, there is. There is one slide which is missing. <laughs> so as I said, so the ultimate goal of this program would be to solve a special class of superconformal for dimensional young mill series. And when we're talking about supersymmetric young mill series, we have in series which involve interacting gauge fields, ferment and scalars, and depending how you arrange scalars and ferments, you could enhance enhance your supersymmetry. So you could have extended supersymmetry. And the uh, nice feature about those theories is that basically they depend only on two parameters. One of the parameters is the rank of the gauge group, and uh, we were dealing with the unitary <coughs> group, so NC is the number of color of the rank of the gauge group. And the second parameter becomes whose coupling constant with just combination of the young mill coupling constant, and this parameter NC. So the goal is uh, to try to find various observables in those theories for arbitrary values of lambda and divide symmetrical expansion powers of 1 over c square. And this parameter basically related to the planarity of the corresponding contribution. So obviously, this is a, a goal is too ambitious. We're not there yet. But what I try to show you during my talk is that there is a very special class of the observables for which actually this problem could be carried out. And the reason why it could be carried out, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here, because there is integrability behind. So the punchline of my talk would be to show you how I could exploit integrability so write down the closed expression for certain observable, which I will define later on. So let, let's first ask kind of the philosophical question. What do you expect to find as a function of this parameter lambda? So as I told you, this parameter lambda measures interaction between different particles. So if lambda is small, if you're in the coupling regime, you could turn on Feynman diagram technique to compute any observables to any order of the coupling expansion, depending on your computer power. But what about strong coupling? The strong coupling, you don't have any perturbative tools. You have to rely on something else. And then, as I will show you later, what something else is a technique which will allow us to go to strong coupling, actually, remarkably enough, will be related to yet another object, which is straight figure distribution, first discussed in the context of the random matrices. So one of my talk would be I will first introduce you canonical definition of this distribution. And then we'll start going through observable to another observables and to see how the stress dividend distribution emerges naturally. And the observables which I'm going to consider, it will be free energy or very special and equal to superagonal theory on four dimensional sphere. And then another observable, which is indifferent theory, it's not related to the first one, it's correlation function of so-called infinitely heavy half DPS operator. In n equal 4, namely maximum supersymmetric young mill theory. And this object here already appeared in the talk yesterday under the name of the octagon by Nico. And finally, after we will come to uh, this point, so we will find some nice representation of those observables, and then you will see that yet another magical formula will appear, and this formula goes under the name of Sigur Ahiezer Katz formula. So this formula, together with representation of those mm -hmm. observables in this tracy distribution, allows you to answer the question which I formulated previously, namely, we will see how one will be able to control the dependence of the observables on the coupling constant. So let's start. What? So what do we expect of strong coupling? So I told you that we coupling everything is simple, but what about strong coupling? And you already seen in the talk of Kostya, he has presented you one of those observables which you controlled exactly in a particular n-equal theory, namely circular Wilson loop. And the circular Wilson loop could be thought in the following terms. So imagine you have charged particles which goes along around circle, 
it creates radiation around it, and the radiation means gauge particle ferment and scatters, and then it interacts with this interaction. And then you can do the circulation of these fields which created by this particle along circle contour, and you try to find it how it depends on the coupling constant. And then if you go to the planar limit, namely you neglect the corrections which suppress by 1 over t, you will find quite a remarkable result, which already Costa has shown you, namely that this Wilson loop in this theory and that limit turned out to be closely related to this modified Bessel function. And once you have such analytical expression, which is very funny value of the coupling constant, you try to analyze how does it behave for various parameters of lambda. So when you go to lambda much smaller, means you just look for the weak interaction, it starts from one, and then there's a series of powers of the lambda with some coefficient. So once again, one plus something small. However, if you go to strong coupling, lambda much bigger than one. It becomes convenient to write this answer kind of exponentiated form, and the exponent all of a sudden has very interesting structure. Name it start with the correction which is square root of lambda, and I remind the lambda is large. Then you have terrible logarithmic in lambda, and then infinite series on powers one of square root of lambda. So such kind of behavior, namely if you go to large lambda and you observable exponentiates in such particular pattern, basically what's written here, it goes under the name semi-classical asymptotics and DSTFT. And in general, if you forget about Wilson loops, there is yet another class of the observables for which a strong coupling, you will find something like this. So you take logarithms of your observable, and the strong coupling, it will have such a structure, square root of lambda, log term, etc., etc., etc. And if you want to control this object as strong coupling, basically you have to find the way how to compute those coefficients which appear in front of those powers of lambda. And then thanks to DACFT, for example, the case of the Wilson loop, we know that A0, the leading term, it's related to the minimal area <coughs> in the gas space. Whereas correction A1, B, and etc., etc., cetera, cetera appear for fluctuation of those surfaces, and it's very, very complicated to compute them. Basically, starting from coefficient A2, nothing <coughs> is known on the DACFT side. Very good. So these are kind of general definition of those observables we're going to discuss, but now let me give you a definition of the various freedom distribution. So the stress freedom distribution appeared in the study of the statistics of the space of eigenvalues in the <coughs> matrix models. And as I told you, for the sake of simplicity, I will consider Hermitian matrix models, namely we're dealing with the matrix n by n. And the simplest Gaussian unit ensemble is just given by this. So you integrate over <coughs> matrix element A with the Gaussian measure. And as you know very well, if you go to the eigenvalues, taking out integral of <coughs> angular variables, you arrive to the integral of the eigenvalues lambda of n with van der Waals with Gaussian measure. And you could consider this integral as defining sort of statistical ensemble when you integrating all the parameters lambda, which are real parameters on the real axis, with very special measure. And then we go to a slight generalization, namely you go to so-called Laguerre ensemble, which also could be thought as kind of statistical ensemble, the difference compared to the Gaussian one, that first of all, the eigenvalues now live only on semi axis, they are positive. The same uh, Van der Mond is here, and you modify this Gaussian measure by putting here something which is, looks like lambda in power L, L a parameter, arbitrary real parameter bigger than minus one, and here you have exponential factor minus lambda. So this becomes kind of natural generalization of this Gaussian ensemble, and it goes in the name of the Laguerre ensemble. So once you have these two ensembles, as usual, you start to discuss different equations about distribution of the eigenvalues. And for example, one natural quantity you might consider, if you take those integrals, you fixed certain number of eigenvalues, you integrate the remaining one, and this way you will get probability density for fixed number n eigenvalue, which is formally given by the expectation value of the delta function. And then there is classical result from the matrix models, I believe Duke, Mehta, and Dyson, that this uh, <coughs> distribution density could be expressed as determinant of sort of matrix K. And this matrix is constructed as building a combination of certain orthogonal polynomials. So phi K and phi X and Y, they relate to orthogonal polynomials like that. So here you have exponential factor multiplied by some polynomial, starting from index K. And for Laguerre polynomial, it becomes slightly more complicated. Laguerre goes under the name of Laguerre because this polynomial becomes Laguerre polynomials. In this case, you'll have Hermit polynomials. So basically, once you have definition of these two ensembles, 
it becomes kind of straightforward to compute this quantity. But now what you want to do, you want to consider limit n to infinity. So what's going to happen when n goes to infinity? So if you're staying within Gaussian ensemble, you know very well that eigenvalues will be distributed on some circle. But the Lagrange ensemble situation is slightly more complicated because you have uh, this barrier at the zero, namely eigenvalues leave only <coughs> positive values of x's. You will find the distribution of eigenvalues follows slightly different pattern. Basically, it's this function over here, which means that it <coughs> goes around x to 1 exactly as <coughs> um, semicircle. On the other hand side, if you go to x equal to 0, it blows up at 1 of the square root of x. So this becomes kind of the curve. And looking at this curve, you could distinguish three different regimes. So one regime would correspond to so called soft edge, which are located close to the end point of the distribution. Second one, bulk, when you get somewhere in the middle. And finally, you could consider the region close to this wall, which is called hard edge. And then there's also yet another very well known result that if you now zoom into each of this area, you will find that this <coughs> matrix K, which we seen on the previous slide, after certain rescaling X and Y, turned out to have universal form. Namely, if you're staying at the bulk, for example, right here, you will find that if you zoom into this interval, this <coughs> function k reduces to the ratio of sin over x. This is called sin function. And this function, as I told you, describes the definite distribution of eigenvalues in this part of the spectrum. If you go to the soft, soft edge over here, similar to the Gaussian ensemble, you will find that this reduces to every kernel. However, if you go to the hard edge, Something new will happen, namely, close to the hard edge, you will find that this function k reduces to such a combination which involves Bessel functions with index L. And I remind you that index L appeared when I defined the Laguerre ensemble. So this becomes a very nice integral operator. And the reason why this operator is interesting is because if you ask the question, for example, what is the probability that there is no eigenvalues on certain interval? For example, you go to this hard edge, which is a certain interval length s. And you ask the question, what's the probability that there is no eigenvalues of this interval? And once again, there is classical result in the matrix models that the corresponding probability will be given by the Fedor determinant of exactly this integral operator k, which is the case of the hard edge, becomes basic kernel. So this object here goes under the name of basic kernel. So you forgot the word no in your sentence? The, Please. the word no is missing there, the probability that there are eigenvalues? The probability? Uh, the, Sorry, there is no eigenvalue. Sorry. Thank you. No, no. So the very important word which is missing. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who have never seen Fred Gold Determinant before, these are basically some symbolic notation for uh, such infinite sum when you sum over uh, objects which are the determinant of this uh, matrix K, X, I, S, J integration variable, and then you sum over all possible number of those integration variables from one to infinity. So in this way, uh, what uh, <coughs> these matrix models, at least this uh, ensemble tells you, that depending on which part of the spectrum you're located, you're dealing with Fredol determinant of one of the three operators. And for reasons which become clear in, later on, we will be more interesting on the basic operator. Yes. So let's specify. <coughs> Let's uh, consider in more details <coughs> this basic operator. And then the trace of the distribution is this prediction that if you're thinking about this probability, there is no eigenvalues for the integral of from 0 to s, trace of them give you different answers. They tell you that this probability is exponential minus one quarter certain integral which looks some capital function Q. And what's remarkable, this basically was the <coughs> main result, that this function Q evaluated at the edge of your spectrum satisfy Penlevé differential equation. So this information is sufficient to define, to compute this function <coughs> for arbitrary values of s. And if you do so, what you will find, you will find a picture like that. So on the vertical axis, there is a probability of having no eigenvalues on the interval from 0 to s. And this picture is quite natural. If you go to small values of s, you're asking the question, what's probability that there is no eigenvalues on sufficiently small interval? Obviously, it's probability is 1. But if you go to large values of s, 
And you ask the, yourself the question, was the probability there is no eigenvalues of large interval? Obviously, it's almost zero. And that is the reason why you have such <coughs> rapidly decaying function. And if you uh, take these two formulas, it becomes straightforward actually to work out the expansion of this function in these two different parts of this plot. For example, for s much smaller than 1, you will have 1 plus some correction, which is powers of s. The <coughs> power depends on l. And if you go to large s, it becomes exponential of something when the limiting term is s, log s, 1 to the square root of s. And at that moment, if you remember formulas for the Wilson loop, which I have shown you before, you will immediately realize that there is a remarkable similarity between these formulas and those for the Wilson loop. So if you will identify formula s the square root of lambda, these two functions have similar behavior to what you would expect for the Wilson loop at weaker strong coupling. And this was kind of the first hint the something goes on. There is some relation between the receiver distribution for this basal kernel and certain observables in the psychometric gauge series. But we will see this more in detail. To do so, I will need slightly generalize this basal kernel which appeared in the previous slide, the one which was considered by Teresa Widom. And uh, the generalization goes under the name of finite temperature generalization of the basal kernel. So how do you generalize it? Let me first remind you what was the definition of this function k. So it was sum of a certain orthogonal polynomials. And now if you go to the limit n to infinity and you zoom to this hard h of your spectrum, you will find that those function reduces to the better. It's not surprising because uh, it was basically kernel. So the remarkable feature of this function is that they actually are normal on the interval from 0 to infinity. And once they form a normal basis, it becomes quite natural to project this integral operator on those basis functions. And in this way, you could replace your integral operator by some matrix. And since number of those functions is infinite and runs from 1 to infinity, in this way, you replace your integral operator by infinite dimensional matrix K. And this matrix K has very interesting structure. So it has some prefactor in front. And here you have integral from 0 to infinity dx dx of product of two basic functions. And here I put some function k. This function is very important. Why it's important? If the function was not there, this integral will basically chronicle nm because this function form autonomous basis. So it's only because of the present function k that this uh, matrix is non-trivial. So by some uh, reasons, in mathematical literature, this function k is called symbol of the basal operator. And it's convenient to parameterize it like x, integration variable, divided by some auxiliary parameter g. So in this way, if you have such a matrix, it becomes such forward to see that this determinant, fretwell determinant of the basic kernel could be replaced by the determinant of this semi-infinite matrix, k and m. And obviously, this determinant depends on the function chi. That is the reason why I put subscript chi to indicate that this object depends on the choice of function chi. For example, if I choose chi to be 1 minus x over here, this effectively will replace upper integration limit by 2g. And in this way, what you will find, you will come back to what we've seen before, with the length of the interval proportional to g. So if g is small, you're talking about small length. If g is large, you're talking about large length. And this is a synonym of what I was telling before, that you could think about g like a coupling constant. And in this way, small s corresponds to weak coupling, large s corresponds to strong coupling. But now let's try to generalize. So this case, chi being kita function, is exactly the one which was considered in the classical paper by Tracy Widom. But now you could play with different choices of this function. For example, one natural choice just to take, replace it by the <coughs> direct distribution. So imagine you put on this like that. So you have chemical potential, temperature. Obviously, if temperature goes to 0, this function reduces the step function. But if you have t and mu it becomes kind of natural deformation of this function, such that frequent determinants will depend both the chemical potential and temperature. So as we'll see later, in the psychometric field series, we had dealing with yet another generalization. So as we'll see later, two observables which are going to consider. In the both cases, we will encounter exactly the same matrix, but with different form of function chi. For example, in one case, it will be something like that. Minus one divided by the vertical sign of square. And Second example will be a relative correlation function with the ratio of cosh functions. And if you remember Ivan's talk, such function already appeared in his talk. When he was presented yesterday, please. So uh, we know the exact uh, form of, uh, of this determinant in the trace Widom case, but 
Do we know anything about the finite temperature of Fermi Dirac? Uh, in terms of closed form of the result? Let me give you an answer, and you will see now uh, later why uh, it's so. Uh, so, as I told you, in the case of theta function, <coughs> this function Q, you remember there was an uh, expression for the trace within distribution, I told you it satisfied Penleva equation. So, you see, this, this is a local differential equation. At the moment, you go to the arbitrary function chi, you will have similar formula, but the difference that Q so that's why we're not differential by integrate differential equation. Basically, at the moment you make a new function chi, not step function, but like a smooth function, you make objects completely non-local, meaning that you don't have any more differential equation, you have integral differential equations. You will see them later during my talk. But what's common? So if you say I'm thinking about those functions, what's common about those functions? If you go to the limit x to infinity, you will see that they uh, decrease at large x sufficiently fast. Basically, they decrease exponentially fast at large x. So this was uh, kind of the short review of trace medium distribution. But now let's try to see how does this trace medium distribution appears in the context of different uh, observables which are going to discuss. So let's first start discussing this very special object, which is free energy and then equal to super Camille theory. So we are going to consider the symmetric angle theory. So I told you, you have a lot of <coughs> particles in that theory. You have gauge fields, Fermi, and scalars. And here you have chose very particular form of the matter. Maybe you chose some high dimensional representation of the matter, so-called symmetric and symmetric representation for the matter. And once you introduce additional matter, you have to verify the theory remains conformal. Or another way of saying, <coughs> You start from the theory which was conformal, you're adding some meta, you want to be sure that it remains conformal. And indeed, this kind of beta function in this n equal to theory, you could verify this assignment of the meta, and beta function vanishes in it. So the second uh, remarkable feature that this was shown by Peston, the partition function of the theory on sphere, it means so-called localization. Namely, it could be written as a matrix integral of zero modes of the scalar field on a sphere. So this A, this is a constant scalar field on the sphere. These are what left over from the action of this theory on the sphere. And here you have a product of two factors. One of them, one of them, that one, comes as a contribution of the instanton. And this contribution exponentially is smaller at large n, therefore we just could throw it away. And the remaining one, this one, it comes from the one loop determinant. Namely, you're talking about fluctuation of the classical configuration. And the ratio of determinant. And in this theory, ratio of determinant is given explicitly by this formula. It's an also called H function, which is defined over here. So this kind of determinant, you can see that the product goes of the eigenvalues with some regularization <coughs> for this object to be finite. And if you expand the powers of this parameter x, which is argument of this function, basically you will get exponential, which is given by the infinite sum of Riemann data value of these odd arguments and the powers of parameter x. So now here you have expression which is written in terms of eigenvalue, but it becomes convenient to rewrite the same expression in terms of the traces of the matrix. So what you do, you're expanding these functions basically in lambda i and lambda j, and then you convert powers of lambda i and lambda j into traces. If you do so, you will find that this <coughs> combination of this H function takes the following form. So you have double sum. What's more important, inside double sum, you have product of two traces. So you have trace A in some odd power, times trace in another odd power. So what does it mean? It means that in this particular ethics model, <coughs> you have the first term, which is Gaussian term, no interaction. And the interaction comes from this particular expression, which has very peculiar form of being product of double traces. The number of those interaction vectors is, is infinite because sum goes from one to infinity. So you arrived at a very peculiar matrix model, <coughs> which has infinite sum of interaction terms, each of them being double trace. The, the modulus of x is smaller than one. Is there some assumption on range on the eigenvalues? Because you have a series expansion, like this harmonic polylog, basically, that you get, right? Yeah. You, you are some downstairs. Yeah, yes, this series, so the, the, the re, there should be a radius of convergence. Uh, how, how much is that? Is infinite or? Like, uh, because x is a value taken by lambdas, basically, right? So, uh, well, I uh, can't tell you just right away. 
there, there is a deep finite range of commutes, but I couldn't tell you right away it's respect. You would ask you how, what's the radius respect to x? I was just worried, yes, that uh, if you have certain radius of convergence, if you, everything is okay together with the range where you expect eigenvalues. But probably, yes. Yeah, you, uh, basically, you, what, what you're saying, you're anticipating. <coughs> so if this function has finite range of convergence, at the end of the day, after we get to the calculation of function f, the property of this function will translate into convergence property of the answer. Yeah. So the, then the question would be, uh, what do you expect to have for this free energy as a function of the parameter? Yes. We'll have finite rate of convergence, it will be brain ensemble, et cetera, We will come to that, you will see later. So now let's try to compute this <coughs> matrix, model, matrix model integral. So I'm doing some reshuffling, some rescaling, so that <coughs> the leading Gaussian term has canonical form, n times trace a square. Dependence of the coupling is factorized over here, and it also synthesizes some of double traces. So I remind you that here you have interaction term, which is given by infinite sum of double traces. Those all, all indices, the double traces. And here you have coupling constant, which appear in front, the CKN, which have very special form. Those which come from the expansion of those H functions, which involve Riemann zeta values for odd arguments. And here you have this coupling constant sitting in the power k plus n plus 1. So you have the matrix C explicitly dependent on the coupling constant. Now what we'd like to do, we'd like to develop topological expansion for this function f. And then it becomes quite straightforward to see that because those objects involve traces of odd power of the matrix, this interaction does not modify the leading planal behavior. In other words, the leading term is expansion of free energy, we scale like n squared, comes entirely from this term, and it's quite trivial. So this interaction will affect contribution starting from genus 1, from F1. And this F1 will come from diagram of topology of torus. So how could you construct this torus? Basically, what you will define, you look for this term, which double trace, and you associate correlation function of this double trace with kind of the cylinder. And this cylinder parameterized by two integers, k and a, which define the powers of the corresponding matrices here. And then what you do, you start gluing these cylinders together to get the torus. And when you glue two cylinders with indices, different indices, for example, this cut here, it comes exactly with those coefficients ckn. So this way, this free energy becomes infinite sum of the possibilities to glue a different cylinder into big torus. And if you do some combinatorics, you will find that actually the contribution of such kind of objects which n cylinders will be given by the sum from n from, from 1 to infinity, 1 of 2n, and then you have trace of two matrices. One matrix is C, which is explicitly given here, another matrix Q, which is given by the correlation function of the traces. And since indices k and n are infinite, this is kind of formal object, namely it's trace of semi-infinite matrix. But if you sum respect to n, you could easily verify that this object here is nothing else as one half of the log for the determinant identity matrix minus product of these two matrices. Like once again, one matrix which is, you compute explicitly by doing Gaussian integration, it's just kinematical matrix. But not trivial one is this one. And I remind you this matrix C, its form. It's coming from localization formula for free energy. So this seems to be quite complicated. But then small miracle happens. Namely, if you now take into account the basic form of those matrix, for example, here I give you expression for the matrix Q, it's just product of two ratio gamma functions, some factor k plus one plus one, and then there is some non-planar correction which I will throw away for the moment. If you now multiply these two functions together, you do some gymnastics, you will find that up to similarity transformation, product of these two matrix takes exactly the same form we've seen before. So all of a sudden, <coughs> You take the product of these two matrix and you find that it's basically almost equivalent to this basic matrix which you've seen before with very special symbol chi. So I remind you, symbol chi is the one which added the definition of our kernel. And since we have everything well defined, you immediately read from my formulas, this function chi becomes exactly minus one of sin square x over two. So what you conclude from that, that computing this <coughs> localization matrix integral, the leading contribution which is coming from the genus one diagrams, is nothing else as a one half trace logarithms of, okay, it's related to logarithms of Fregol determinant, and Fregol determinant is exactly the one which defines trace unit distribution with modified symbol. 
And once again, this G, the parameter G, which I introduced previously, now it's identified exactly as a square root of lambda divided by 4 pi. And I remind you <coughs> that similar to the trace window distribution, you realize that large values of lambda correspond to the big interval in trace window distribution, small values of lambda to the short interval. So let's continue. Let's now go to a completely different observable. So previously we were discussing free energy on the sphere, and this is an equal to theory. Now let's go to another theory, which is maximally supersymmetric diagonal theory, and equal for theory, and we're going to discuss four-point correlation function with special class of the operator. And those operators and the object which we're going to discuss have been already introduced by Enrique in his talk, but I will remind you <coughs> uh, its definition. So I told you that in this supersymmetric series, you're dealing with the scalars, among other particles, and here, and this here, you have three complex colors. So let's choose two of those complex colors, which you know by letter Z and X. Let's choose operator in a very special form. So one operator will be traced with Z in power K over 2. K is parameter which we'll play later on. X bar K over 2. Second operator is built only from X's, and last one from Z bars. And then you want to compute correlation function moving those operators. These operators are special. They're special that because of the supersymmetry, they're protected. This means that the scaling dimension don't receive any corrections. The two and three point function are protected. And the first correlation function is not protected, it's four point correlation function. So now what we're going to do, we're going to consider four point correlation function where at point one and three, I'm inserting this particular operator. At point two, I'm inserting an operator like that. And at point four, operator like this. Why do so? Because if you start computing the corresponding Correlation function, let's say, we coupling for zero value of the coupling constant, you will find the only way how you could contract different color field is just to have the diagram shown here. For example, we have point one. By definition, point one has k over two scholars z, which are shown here by, by, uh, by black. And here you have k over two scholars x bar, which is shown here by blue. And then if you just take into account uh, what goes on in from other methods, you will find this is the only configuration of the There is no other possibility to contract scalar fields. And these are very important because you could see that those propagators form kind of the frame, right? You have kind of frame built from the bunch of the, of the scalar propagators. And the number of these scalar propagators, which you change between any pair of points, is defined by this letter k. And later on, we will consider the limit when we send this k to infinity. In other words, we're going to consider extremal case of the correlation function. <coughs> when in each of these vertices you have infinitely many scalar fields. And they arrange themselves in such a way that they form kind of the frame. And once you turn the interaction, they start to interact. You could exchange gluon, fermions, whatever you like. So this becomes a correlation function we want to discuss. And because the series conformal, as usual, you could rewrite this correlation function in terms of some function which is conformally invariant. It depends on two cross ratios, which are defined over here. And it, by some technical reason, it becomes convenient to switch from the cross ratios to complex variables z and z bar, like that. And that is the reason why, as argument, I put here z z bar. And always, you keep in mind that, among other parameters, there's also the <coughs> coupling constant. So our goal will be to compute this calligraphy function g and delimit k to infinity for arbitrary value of coupling constant. For arbitrary z z bar. Or arbitrary z z bar. But z z bar is kinematical, kinematical parameters. So this is external kinematical parameters. So why is this k to infinity limit is special? Actually, it was realized by Coronado some time ago that in this limit, something interesting happens. So two things will happen. So if you will start computing your correlation function using Feynman diagram, you will be dead already quite soon. If you starting from two loop, the number of diagram proliferates so fast that it's almost impossible to compute each diagram separately. However, what was uh, observed by Coronado using integrability <coughs> technique, et cetera, et cetera, that actually if you sum all diagrams together, quite remarkably, the expression of a correlation function could be expressed only in terms of special class of the integrals. And those are led integrals, which already appeared in Volodya talk. And those are fishnet integrals. So F1, et cetera, all those integrals are depicted here. This is led the integral. So they are parameterized by some letter L. L is basically number of integration points. But it doesn't matter what number of integration points. You could write kind of explicit expression for this function f in terms of the classical polylogs. 
And you see that this bar, the way convenient variables, because if you were dealing with residual cross thresholds, so the ZZ bar will have see some ugly squares. Anyway, so this F, I explicitly written function, which depends on kinematical variables Z and Z bar. And now, what will happen is that this is limit k to infinity, our correlation function is expressed in only in terms of those integrals f. And moreover, somehow it naturally organizes itself into square of some object which are called octagon. So this calligraphic O here goes of the name of the octagon, and this octagon has the following general form. Basically, it's given by a multilinear combination of the uh, left integral, you see f i1, etc., etc., and those integrals have some initial weight. So that if you fix the order at decoupling expansion, the total weight of the product of this function should be match the order of decoupling expansion. And then also what was shown by Frank or another, that if you did now explicit expression for this coefficient d, it was sufficient to require that our correlation function satisfies all necessary conditions, namely if you go to short distance limit with respect to each pair of points, you should have some prescribed behavior coming from the p. So this information alone is sufficient to fix those coefficients to any order of expansion. So in this way, this expansion could be expanded to any order of the current. And as I told you, to any order, you're always dealing with a multilinear combination of those function f. So the next question, is it possible to resum this infinite series so that you'll get expression which is valid for any value of the coupling constant? And here comes Ivan Didina and Valina Petkova. They uh, presented very nice, elegant formula for some of all those <coughs> letter integral. And the final expression looks very simple, relatively simple. Namely, basically what happens is this octagon, which I defined previously, turned out to be related to the square root of determinant of, of semi-infinite matrix. So here you have, sorry for confusion with notation, it's C, it's not the same C we've seen before, it's not the matrix C. And here you have matrix H. So once again, Form of this matrix is uniquely fixed by object which you define from the very beginning, plus some additional variability technique. So matrix C is quite simple. So it uh, basically has two diagonals parallel to the main one. And the corresponding prefactor is defined by variable Y, which is intrinsically related to those kinematical invariants which you defined before. What's not trivial is matrix H. So the matrix H in semi-infinite matrix, which is given by the overlap of two basic functions with indices n and m. And now you could see this parameter g, psi, and y kind of spread across the formula. And this integral, this integral looks quite complicated. So once again, g is a coupling constant. Psi and y, where is y? Uh, y. These are kinematical parameters defined by the external points. So this representation allows you to compute this octagon at decoupling because you could expand the determinant powers of matrix C and H, and this is where you could reproduce this expression you've seen on the previous slide, but what about strong coupling and that agent of arbitrary coupling? And yet another remarkable feature emerges, namely, similar to what we've seen before, there exists similarity transformations, which basically sim simplifies enormously this function H and C, such that after similarity transformation, this ugly-looking matrix H becomes exactly the same <coughs> basic function, basic matrix we've seen before, with special form of this symbol chi. So this symbol chi, which parameterizes kernel, now carries dependence on parameters of our series. So it depends on the coupling constant, depends on one xi, and here it is. So some combination of uh, Gabriel Cosinus, which you've seen at the beginning of my talk. So at that moment, what you conclude? You conclude that you start from correlation function, you went to the limit k to infinity, you arrived at this Frigol determinant. The Frigol determinant coincides with the trace within distribution for the Bessel kernel, for the Bessel operator, for different value of parameter L and for different value of the symbol. So for both cases, for correlation function and for free energy, somehow you end up with the same observer. Just to summarize what I tried to explain you, so we started with the free energy. With this sub gymnastic, we arrive to the basal kernel with this symbol. We start with the four-point function in different theory. These sub gymnastics obtain similar basal kernel with yet another symbol. But what about Wilson loop? You remember my first example, which I have shown you. I told you that Wilson loop allows it meets exact representation 
basic modified basic divided by something, and if you kind of go to the extreme with my logic, you would expect that since everything is present with the pre-good determinant of basic kernel, we will somewhat also should be expressed in a similar way. And indeed, it turns out that if you choose chi to be this very simple function, function minus 4 of x squared, the corresponding Bessel <coughs> determinant is exactly coincides with the Wilson loop which you've seen in my previous slides. So it seems that for quite big class of the observables in a different gauge series, you always find the Frigol determinant of the same Bessel operator but with different choice of the symbol. And once again, if you now want to exploit this representation to compute the observable, at weak coupling, as I told you, you're dealing with Bessel operator defined a short interval. This allows you to expand the trigonal determinant, the power of the traces, and basically each trace is here is suppressed by power of the coupling constant. And if you want to vector out millions of terms of the expansion, you basically expand this log determinant, increasing power of uh, this operator key, and becomes kind of straightforward. Press the button, and you will get any number of parameters which are shown here, C1, C2, C1. But now, the question is... So the, you mean that um, if you take chi 1 over x squared, then you can compute this as some polynomial. The, you can compute the determinant exactly, exactly. and it will yes. give some polynomial. No, it gives you a basic function. If, if ah. you choose, just to summarize, you start with the basic uh, matrix, which oh. depends on the function chi. I put function chi in this particular form. Yes. Uh, what the reason why this uh, form is special because the corresponding semi-infinite matrix uh, K basically it will now will reduce us to three diagonals only. And then the uh, uh, gold determinant of such matrix will compute analytically exactly. It is given by the modified basic with index one. Which means that there is let's put it differently, there is a certain choice of symbol which this de gold determinant could be computed exactly. This is one of them. There is yet another class of the symbol where you could do it exactly. But for this particular uh, symbol, chi, you reproduce exactly what's loop. Is it possible to find some kernel that it will give? You find a correction? Yes. Uh, well, I don't know. But it's, uh, since we know the exact expression for the Wilson loop, loop, the Laguerre polynomial, et cetera, it's an interesting question to consider. But uh, <coughs> really, uh, I don't see another reason for for and contra. Once we try. So, so how, how exactly the coupling constant appears here? It appears uh, it through, through ratio x over g. So basically, uh, I told you that uh, you, you could... In the, in the octagon here now, no? Additionally, in the, yeah, it's just the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just simply yeah. wrote it. But the, the reason why I wrote it in this way is that if you move the scale x to the coupling constant, so, and the coupling constant over the scale x, so that uh, you intuitively you realize that this g defines effectively the interval, in, interval with respect to which integrating over. And once again, if g is small, you could put here g, so integral becomes trivial to compute. But at large g, you're dealing with a big hard problem. Now you have a well-defined mathematical problem. Namely, <coughs> you have a regular determinant of this modified basal kernel of the sign function chi, okay? and you want to understand if it's a pretty behavior for IG. So it's a well-defined problem. It turns out that this problem has a long story. And this story actually started in 1915 with a uh, gentleman who already uh, Paul mentioned previously, is the same per person, Sigur. And another remarkable feature of this particular paper that it was written when the author was 18 years old. And they could imagine that uh, this was not very quiet time in Europe. So he was drafted to <coughs> uh, Austrian army because at that time Hungary was part of the Austrian Empire. And somehow he managed to work into some uh, you know, uh, quiet, press, quiet place uh, close to uh, com commanders, I don't know, whatever. Some, some place when he had some time to think about different things. And some spare time before the war, he wrote that paper, which later was dubbed as the first Sigur Theorem. It was 1915. So then uh, he was involved in doing different things, including classical uh, papers about orthogonal polynomials. And sometime later, after the war, he heard that uh, a person named Manzager <coughs> found the exact solution of the dimensionizing model. And what he was trying to understand the solution. So since the, exact the, the explanation for the solution was published much later, 
I don't, don't remember all these dates. He decided to uh, find the solution himself. And what, the way how he found the solution, he knew that, for example, spontaneous magnetization in the Isaac model could be rewritten as certain uh, determinant of some matrix, finite dimensional matrix. And if you go to the continuum limits, this matrix becomes infinite dimensional. And then what he did, <coughs> he came up with the second figure theory, because the first figure theory was telling you the correlation function of two spins on the latest size L will have this particular behavior, exponential minus length times A0. <coughs> but he wanted to compute some leading correction. So he formulated the second figure theory, and it was something around uh, 53. And then uh, what people did later, and these are here and cuts, so they figure out that if you start, start with a, a kind of discretized version of the real determinant, there is a very nice continuum limit when the matrix becomes integral operator, and this first and second figure theorem was formulated by Heizer and Katz as an asymptotic expansion of the determinant of the integral operator. And the final expression they obtained is this. So you have exponential minus the leading term, which is g times a naught plus b and some subleading correction. So the first figure theorem tells you that in order to find a naught, you have to go through two steps. So you start with the logarithms of one minus symbol, you take it Fourier, and then you evaluate this Fourier at zero. So minus two times value of zero, it gives you the leading term. And how could you find phase transition in the Isaac model? So if you identify corresponding chi in the Isaac model, what Sigur was not observed, there is sort of various parameters of <coughs> like critical temperature, for which A0 vanishes. And if A0 vanishes, it means that your correlation function doesn't decay exponentially, but decay differently. But how decay you have to compute subleading terms? So what about subleading terms? So this parameter B, again, is second figure C, which tells you that to find term which is G0, you have to take the same function Fourier transform of log of the symbol and take its integral with respect to K. So this formula with the first term is exactly this S1K formula, which was formulated finally about 1966. And everyone was happy until these two gentlemen came over. So they had another problem to consider, and they observed that in their case, the symbol chi had the following behavior. For z goes to zero, it was one, minus something in power to beta, beta arbitrary parameter. And they figured out that if you have such kind of behavior around the origin, if you go through the Fourier, you will find this function of psi tilde of k, Fourier <coughs> into one. Behave at large k like minus beta of k. Now, if you substitute this behavior in this integral, you will find that b diverges. So this behavior, it's called fissure hartwig singularity. Actually, there is two types of singularities, but the one which you need is exactly this which I displayed here. So what does it mean? It means that every time you encounter such kind of symbols, you should be prepared for this formula to be modified because it becomes divergent, and you kind of could hint already that the divergence will translate to some logarithmic behavior with respect to G. So this brings us to a second step, namely what you have to do now is to generalize this formula for very special class of symbols which do have such kind of singularity. And this turned out to be a very interesting problem for mathematic physics, and surprisingly to us, this problem has not been solved yet. <coughs> there are some brave people who uh, computed this determinant for some special values of parameter L. Remember, L it was a parameter which entered the basal kernel. But for general values of parameters, it hasn't been done yet. So we jumped to this problem, and together with Andrei Belitsky, we came up with some conjecture. The conjecture goes as follows. So now, if your symbol chi has this singularity, the first three terms of the expansion look like that. The first term is the same as before. It's exactly the term. So the terms which are g0, which was previously divergent, now it becomes regular. And the way how it becomes regular, you have log g behavior. So you have two coefficients, a1 and b prime, and those coefficients are given here. And what quite surprisingly, coefficient a1, which appears in front of the log, it depends on only one parameter. It doesn't depend on the shape of the function chi. It depends only on the behavior of the function around the origin. In other way, for different function chi which have the same beta, this term is universal. And these are what's peculiar feature of this singularity. And finally, this B prime is some ugly integral involving Barnes G function, which depends on the beta and depends on the function psi tilde, which we did before. And this combination here ensures you that the integral with such behavior is well defined. So at this moment, doesn't matter which chi we're dealing with, you could use this formula to compute first three terms, a0, a1, and b prime. But there's correction, one over g, right? 
So you, if you want to develop this exposure systematically, you have to find the methods to compute this infinite series corrections, one over G, et cetera, et cetera. And for this purpose, we found another method, which actually had been developed previously by Itz, Izergin, Kurepin, and Slandov to compute <coughs> certain correlation function integrable models. Basically, what we did, we extended the method for our particular case of the basal kernel, <coughs> which I defined previously. And then if you do basically repeat the steps from the papers and book, you will find the following results. So we want to compute this object over here. And for various reasons, it becomes convenient to define logarithmic derivatives. So you take logarithmic derivative of your uh, regular determinant with respect to coupling constant. And here, I just give a set of the equations in the case of the octagon, which is the most complicated one, because it's dependent also on some geometrical parameter y and xi. So therefore, this object here is function of the variables. And then you go through the steps to define equations this function u satisfy. For example, if you want to look for the dependence of this function u with respect to y, here becomes the answer. Namely, the derivative function with respect to y is given by the integral, which involves derivative of a symbol with respect to y, a function q square, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now you see the difference. If chi were a step function, this integral will localized, right? But if it's not a step function, it's not localized. So now you have to deal with this system, the equation. And final equation you have to solve with that one, and it's very complicated because u depends on g in an integral way. So what to do? So we found some uh, way to do the calculation. Basically, we found the way how you could solve this differential equation of power of 1 over g, and here's the final result. So once again, this is a free determinant. The first three terms are given by this secure hedger cards formula, and here you have a subleading term. All those subleading terms are expressed in terms of some interesting integral, which are written here. Basically, you plug a function chi, you compute integral, you get in i's, you go through formula, and you have all terms of the expansion. This is for uh, octagon? Doesn't matter. If you, if, you, if, you, if you take uh, chi, sufficient you have chi. You take chi, <coughs> you plug it in here, you get this function i n, and then this expression over here is universal. They don't depend in which case you're talking about. So this is my last slide. <coughs> let, let me show you how it works. So let's go to the case of the free energy. So I remind you the symbol was given by this hyperbolical sinus minus 2. You plug into formula and you basically done. So you go to the decoupling. This becomes the expansion in powers of the uh, powers of the two coupling constant, powers in lambda with some correction coefficients <coughs> involving auto values of zeta function. And what about strong coupling? So here becomes the result of strong coupling. So you have leading term which is square root of lambda with e with g. Then there is logarithmic term of lambda with universal coefficient. And then you have all other terms of the expansion. So if you want to see how it works, so here on the vertical axis, I plotted the ratio of this free energy divided by the first term. So it should start, it should go to one at strong coupling. So it goes to one. And then if you go to small values of lambda, all these terms enter into the game, and you see that all these black dots with numerical <laughs> computation match perfectly well with the curve. But now coming back to an equal question. If you now look carefully, what does the series tell you? It tells you that there is a problem. Namely, this series has Borel singularities. Its coefficient grow factorially. And then you repeat exactly what Zoli was explaining us. You could go through the resurgence, you could define the linear correction. For example, here I have shown you that the linear correction has this particular form. And basically, you control everything. There is some linear correction, so you go in the power of this parameter. So finally, conclusion. So what I'm trying to show you we considered different uh, gauge series. It was n equal to, n equal to 4. We considered various quantities, different quantities, free energy correlation function also. And by some reason, which we don't quite understand, all those observables at the end of the day expressed in terms of the same universal object, which is trace video distribution for specially have chosen function chi symbol. Well, I wrote this kind of result of the calculation, but there should be some underlying reason for that. You could say it's integrability, but I don't think it's sufficient because such kind of universality is not accidental. <coughs> and uh, once again, why is the same basal kernel appears only in cases? There's many other integrable kernels, but some reason, again, which we don't quite understand, only basal kernel appears in the gauge series. And finally, uh, yet another question which 
question I already mentioned, that should be way how you could include systematic and final corrections, and obviously the question is whether the same universality will persist. These are the kind of questions which was investigated. Thank you very much. So there will be over time. We just one question. So do you expect the same structure for the cusp anomalous dimension also? Uh, answer yes. Yes, yes. Once again, if you look uh, if you look for cusp anomalous dimension, integral equation satisfies. It's basic fun basic yeah, matrices. Yeah. And once again, I could add, I could have added here the list of different observables, and I repeat the same question: Why basal kernel appears in different all those different problems? And somehow, for Casper anomalous dimension, for Nikola Vasilyev, we have some kind of understanding that it has to do with the Zhukovsky map, Fourier transform, etc., etc. There is some logical way to convince yourself that basal is nature over there. But why in other cases you have the same basal? Why for the Wilson loop? Why, why for the Wilson loop you have basal? I missed one, um, one point. So Tracy Vito has different asymptotes. Yes. Right? You, you call it soft, hard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this asymptote belong to one model or yes. different models? One model. Um, so there, there is different Tracy Vito distributions. So as I said, you have... It's fixed one. Yeah, uh, I, the one which is relevant for the HC is the one which corresponds to half H. One one. And others asymptote? No, they don't appear. They don't appear. I see. So it's not really a tracy vision, it's uh, 80, right? No, no, it's not 80, it's basic. Basic, okay. Basic. But it's a kind of tail of uh, tracy vision. Exactly. Why? Why is uh, <laughs> one thing, but, uh, but, the, t but the, the fact that it is not tracy vision, literally, it's basic. No. Tracy vision no, is, uh, is, has different uh, pieces, right? Okay, the problem is the question of definition of what they call trace uh, Trace Trace-video distributions, what is this picture I have shown? Different part of the spectrum for different trace-video distributions. Then let's, let's do the work. So we have different integral operators which in different part of the spectrum. For each of these integral operators, we define the order determinant, but let's call trace-video distribution the order determinant for a particular operator which corresponds to different part of the spectrum. In this way, for this Lagarde, we have three different trace-video distributions depending on which part of the spectrum we want to find. What happens in each series? But all, but not all of them realized. Only one relevant, of them, relevant. Only one of them is realized in the series, and the other one can be. And you, you understand why? No. I mean, it's... no, 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 no. At this point, we need to wrap the discussion. Let's thank the speaker.